Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you came across this message. The sermon you are about to watch is from our verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it is great to be in my home church. I want to thank you for being a church that lives on mission. Thank you for letting my family now live sent out of this fellowship. And thank you for allowing your story to be leveraged and used for the sake of the kingdom. I was just a week and a half ago in Brooklyn, New York with 600 church planters and their wives that are planting churches all over the Northeast in the United States. I fly today as soon as the services end to Chicago. I'm there in Chicago with a group of church planters. And then next week I'm in Miami, Florida with another 600 planters and their wives that are planting churches all over the Southeastern United States. And everywhere I go, I'm taking the DM DNA that God's birthed in us here at Hope Church and sharing that with others. So thank you for being a church that lives on mission and seeks first the kingdom of God. Your story and your faithfulness to the Lord is making a difference across North America for the sake of the nation. So thank you for that. I want to jump right in today with uh, the word that, that God's put on my heart for us this weekend, and I want to begin by making kind of a statement that I think everybody would agree with, and that is that there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that we disagree about, amen? Like there's stuff in there, even as Christians, even as those that would believe in the essentials of the faith, the truths of the gospel, there's still stuff in the Bible that we can disagree about. One person reads it one way, another person reads it another way, and we have some debate around things like spiritual gifts and end-time prophecies and some of the, the mysterious aspects of Scripture. And when you take that outside the realm of faith, there are non-Christians who would discount much and say they don't believe a lot and disagree a lot with what the Bible would say, questioning the very veracity of Scripture scripture itself. But even though there are some things in the Bible as Christians we may disagree on, and there's many things that unbelievers may disagree with in the scripture, I found one verse of scripture. It's actually stated three times in the Bible, twice in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. And this is a verse of scripture that I've never found anybody, Christian or non-Christian, who would disagree with the truth and the claim of this verse. Let me put it up here on the screen, both in the Old and New Testament. Here's the Old Testament. Psalm says, there is none who does good, not even one. In the New Testament, it says it this way in Romans chapter three. There is none is what? Say it out loud. Righteous, not no, not one. Now, both of these Hebrew and Greek constructions, that's the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, the New Testament's written in Greek. The verbs that are used here describe ongoing continuous action. So what these verses are not saying is not that nobody ever does any good. What these verses are saying is nobody does good all the time continuously. I've never met anybody who would say, I've never done anything wrong. If you're here today and your testimony is Christian or non-Christian, I've never done anything wrong. Let me see your hand. And if you raise it, you better be here by yourself, amen? Amen. Because I'm bringing the microphone to the person sitting beside you. And I'm going to ask for a testimony today to prove the veracity of your testimony. I've never done one thing wrong. Nobody would say that. That's exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says there's not one person on earth who can say, I've never done anything wrong. And if we got honest today, and church is a good place to get honest, amen? If we got honest today, we would all say, I've done way more wrong than I've done right. 
I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to stand up here on stage and drag out the scale and put all the right I've done on one side and all the wrong I've done on the other side and let the whole world see how that turns out. I want you to think a minute about some of the wrong. Maybe you don't have to think back too far. <laughs> Maybe it's in the car on the way here. <laughs> Maybe it's this morning when you woke up. Maybe it's yesterday. Maybe it's this past week. A thought, a word an attitude, an action, a desire that you know is not holy and wholesome and yet you foster that desire anyway. You know that stuff I'm talking about, nobody but you and God. Wouldn't it be great to know that all of that is forgiven. You see, the greatest problem we have as human beings is our sin. It's caused us problem in our fellowship relationship with God. It causes us problem in our relationships with each other. The greatest problem we have is sin. Listen, that means the greatest need we have, whether you know it or not, is forgiveness. Can you imagine what it would be like? No guilt. No more shame. No more weight. Let me give you some good news this morning. David in the Old Testament is a man who knew something about sin. Amen? (laughs) Like, if you were going to create big categories of sin, David's name would be at the top of every category. Like, he did them all. And yet, I love this. You know what the Bible said about David? David was a man after God's own heart. You know why I love that? Because it means we all got a shot. Amen? Amen? David understood some truth about God. Let me show it to you in the Psalms. David said, for you, O Lord, are good and, say it out loud, the word forgiving means ready to forgive. In the Hebrew construct, it's the picture of God just waiting. We think God's forgiveness is something that he's holding on to tightly and that we got to earn it and we got to deserve it and we got to work hard enough. But the scripture, David, one who knew much about sin, but he also knew much about God, said, God, you are good and you are ready to forgive abounding in steadfast love, meaning it's just slashing out of the bucket to all who call upon you. Here's my prayer this weekend. It's really birthed out of my, in my heart Thursday night before the service when we prayed. One of the pastors was back there praying. I think it was Pastor Matt Bentley. and He prayed something and the Holy Spirit of God just stirred in my heart. Here's the aim for the weekend. Number one, if you're not a Christian, if you're a non-believer, My prayer for you this weekend is that for the first time in your life, you experience the forgiveness of God. All the the Christians that are in the room, you remember what it was like the first time you experienced the fact that God would forgive your sin? Isn't that good news? Non-Christian, if you're here today, my prayer is that you would experience the forgiveness of God. But listen, my prayer secondly is for those of you that are already believers, some of you that have been forgiven are now carrying back the weight of your sin because you've forgotten how good the forgiveness of God is. For you as believers, my prayer is that you would embrace the forgiveness of God in a fresh and new way. If you're a guest this weekend as a church family, we're studying straight through the gospel of Mark, just verse by verse walking through this gospel. 
This weekend, if you got your Bible, open it to Mark chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 20 in just a minute. We come to a story where Jesus encounters two groups of people, his family and religious leaders, and both groups of people act wrongly towards Jesus. Both of them sin against him. And at the end of the statement, at the end of the story, Jesus makes a powerful statement about forgiveness. And he does it in two ways. First of all, he gives us a very encouraging word, and then he gives us a serious warning. And I want to unpack that. Let's begin reading Mark chapter 3, verse 20. If you don't have a Bible, the words are going to be up here on the screen so you can follow along as I read. Then he went home. Jesus is God in the flesh. He had a home. Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, can you believe this? He's out of his mind. Here's Jesus. Jesus, God in the flesh, who performed miracles and taught with authority and interpreted the scriptures, and he gets home, and the people have heard about him, and they've so been moved by him that they line up to the point that they can't even serve a meal. And Jesus, his family says, Jesus is just crazy. Verse 23, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul. It's a term that was a name that they would use to refer to Satan himself. His family said he's crazy. Now here's these religious leaders, the scribes, and they say he's possessed by Satan. And by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. He called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, <clears throat> that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. Jesus speaks to this idea of being called crazy and being called full of the devil and says, listen, that's not even possible. How could I work against the works of the devil if I'm possessed of the devil? And I want to focus on these next few verses. Truly I say to you, all sins, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. We're going to talk about this in a minute. That, that, that may be the strongest statement on forgiveness ever spoken or written in the Scripture. And yet we read right past it because we get so consumed with the next sentence. There's some mystery and some uncertainty in the next sentence that often overshadows the certainty of the sentence we just read. Let me read it again. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But... Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. We get to that and we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That we miss the truth of what he just said. Let me unpack it in two statements. Number one, God is a forgiving God. Would you say that out loud off the screen up there with me? You ready? One, two, three. God is a forgiving God. Anybody else other than me need to hear that today? God is a forgiving God. Listen, your behavior of the past week has not changed the reality of who he is. God is a forgiving God. The problem is we try to understand God's forgiveness through the lens of the way we forgive. You see, one of the lies of the enemy, you do know that our enemy is a liar. Jesus said of him that he is a liar and the father of all lies. He lies to us constantly. And one of the ways he lies to us is he tells us that God is like us. 
And so we tend to approach God thinking God is like we are. And when it comes to this aspect of forgiveness, God's forgiveness is very different from our forgiveness, and we struggle to understand God's forgiveness because he thinks he, we, we think he forgives like we forgive. Well, how do we forgive? Well, let me give you a few phrases. Number one, our forgiveness is available, but not yet. I'll forgive you, but first I want to see how you behave. I want to see if you're sincere. I want to see if you mean it. I want to see if you deserve my forgiveness. So my forgiveness is available, just, just, just not yet. Here's another way we forgive. I'll forgive you, but my forgiveness is filed, not forgotten. Oh, I forgive you, but I'm going to put that back here in this drawer. And when I need it, when the argument dictates, I'm going back to the drawer I'm opening up the file, and I'm going to say, you remember this? Does that sound familiar to anybody in the room? Maybe you're remembering back to the car ride on the way here today. <laughs> Filed, but not forgotten. We would say our forgiveness is limited, so don't push it. Here's what I mean by that. I'll forgive you. <clears throat> This time. But if you ever. Now we laugh at that because we've all experienced all of this. Here's the problem. When we sin against God, we think that's God's posture towards us. We even sheepishly come back to him, Lord, it's me again. And you know what he says? <clears throat> again, I'm sorry, I have no recollection of what you're talking about. The scripture says he chooses not to remember our sin. God doesn't see you through the filter of your fallenness. God sees you through the filter of his son, Jesus. We prayed it earlier in the service, Lamentations 3. Look what it says. The steadfast love of the Lord never what? Say it out loud. It means it never runs out. It never comes to an end. His mercies never come to an end. It means you can't exhaust them. They are new what? Every great is your what? I'm thankful that my relationship to him does not depend on my faithfulness to him, but on his faithfulness to me. We tend to view the forgiveness of God like our smartphone battery. And if you've got a smartphone, a smart tablet, a smart watch, if all this stuff was so smart, it wouldn't need us. Amen. <laughs> but you got that little battery icon up there. And here's what you know. The more you use the device, the less power you have. That's the way we think God's forgiveness is. That when I got saved, God gave me a full battery. But every time I fail, every time I go back, the battery gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And I just hope I don't run out of battery before it's too late. But here's what the writer of Lamentation said. You can never run out of battery when it comes to God's forgiveness. As a matter of fact, every day when you wake up, the battery's full. It's new every morning. Jesus uses that word forgiveness here in this passage of Scripture. For sake of time, let me give you a definition of the word Jesus uses. The word forgiveness means, and I'll put it on the screen, the removal of the guilt and shame of sin, past, present, and future. That's forgiveness. Amen? Every sin I've ever committed, every sin I'm going to commit today, every sin I'm ever... Wait a minute, Pastor. You're saying Jesus' forgiveness covers sins I hadn't even committed yet? You better hope so. Because when he died on the cross, every sin you've committed was in the future. If the sufficiency of Christ's death doesn't cover sins in the future, we're all in trouble. The forgiveness of God 
covers my sin, past, present, and future. I know what you're thinking. That sounds too good to be true. How's that possible? Here's how it's possible. Because Jesus said so. Let me show it to you. Truly, I say to you, all sin. Ooh, aren't you glad he didn't say most? Aren't you glad he didn't just say the accidental ones? All sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Let me break that down into three truths about forgiveness that are revealed in that statement. Number one, God's forgiveness is available in Christ. And we just sang it, in Christ alone. See how Jesus began that sentence? Truly I say to you. Say the first word out loud. You know that Greek word. You don't know you know that Greek word, but you know the Greek word for the word truly. It's the Greek word, amen. We've transliterated it into English, and it's the word what? Amen, amen, however you want to say it, right? If you're from high society, it's amen. If you're from where I'm from, it's amen. <laughs> it's a Greek word, amen. How do we use the word Amen. When the preacher or somebody says something that you go, hey, that's true, at the end of his sentence, you say what? There you go. And listen, when you do that, it's helpful to the preacher. Let me just tell you. <laughs> the preacher says something that's true, that's in line with the scripture, and you hear it, and in your soul, you resound with a what? That's this word. And it was customary in Jesus' day that when a rabbi, a teacher, a speaker would say something that was true, the crowd would respond and say... I want you to notice something. Go back to the, Jesus amen his own sentence. <laughs> and he didn't wait till he got to the end. He started right out of the gate. Amen. What I'm about to say is so true. What I'm about to say is so right. I'm just going to go ahead and get out of the way. Amen. You see, because of who he was, God, and because of what he was about to do, death, burial, resurrection, he could amen this sentence. Because what he was about to do was about to make it possible for all sins to be forgiven. The word forgiven here as Jesus uses it, all sins will be forgiven as a passive verb. You say, why is that important? The Greek language, the active verb, the subject does the action. And the passive verb, the subject receives the action. Which means this, forgiveness is not something you can earn. It's not something you do to merit it. Forgiveness is only that which can be received based on what somebody else has done. You see, forgiveness is made possible because of Jesus. That's why in Ephesians, Paul wrote it this way. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What does that mean? We have forgiveness through his blood. Here's what it means. Sin had a penalty. Because of our sin, there was a payment, a debt that we owed. The debt was death. We deserve to die spiritually, physically, and eternally. Jesus, God, stepped into time, took on human flesh. God became a man. Jesus lived a sinless life. Then Jesus took all of your sin and all of my sin on himself, on the cross. God poured out his, we sang it a moment ago, the wrath of God against sin was satisfied in the person of Christ. Jesus died physically, spiritually, eternally on the cross in our place, and he paid for our sin, but he did not stay dead. On Sunday morning, God, as a testimony that he'd accepted his sacrifice for our sin, raised him from the dead. And now, through Jesus, we can be forgiven. Because of Jesus, God's forgiveness is available in Christ. Number two, God's forgiveness is available to cover all sin. Did you hear what he said? Truly, I say to you, say it out loud. Say it one more time. Say it like you get it. All sin. You know what that little word all means? It means all. It has two implications in the Greek language. One is all the whole. 
Meaning, you think about Vance Pittman from beginning to end, birth to death, the whole thing, my sin nature, my sinful flesh, every aspect of sin in me, the whole of sin. But it also means all, each, every, every single act, thought, word, deed, action. Oh. Because of Jesus, all. J.C. Ryle said it this way. All sins will be forgiven. The sins of youth and age. The sins of head, hand, tongue, and imagination. The sins against God's commandments. The sins of persecutors like Saul. The sins of idolaters like Manasseh. The sins of open enemies of Christ like the Jews who crucified him. The sins of backsliders from Christ like Peter. All may be forgiven. The blood of Christ can cleanse away all. The righteousness of Christ can cover all and hide all from God's eyes. Unbeliever, you may be here today and you may think that somehow you have gone too far. I've heard people say before, man, I can't go to that church. If I do lightning, it'll strike it. Man, I've gone way too far down the road of rebellion against God. Here's what the word of God says. No, you hadn't. You can't send your way past the grace of God. As a matter of fact, he came for people just like you. This book is full of their stories. Believer, maybe you think that somehow you've exhausted God's grace and forgiveness. You think that God has wearied of you. Here's what Jesus said. Truly, amen. Amen. All sin will be forgiven. There's no sin, no wrong outside the saving grace and power of God's forgiveness. Micah the prophet was overwhelmed by this. Micah one time in the Old Testament, he began to write about God's forgiveness and he was thinking about this idea of how God has covered all of our sin. He's buried it. He's removed it from us. And Micah, honestly, in the Old Testament was kind of overwhelmed by it. Listen to what he says. Who's a God like you? Like who does this? Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast, what does he say? You will cast our sins into the what? Depths of the what? <laughs> you ever lost anything in the ocean? I mean, there's something lost and then there's ocean lost, right? Like you lose it in the ocean, it's gone. You can just be in the shallows in the ocean and you see a seashell and bend over to grab it and before you can grab it, it's gone and you can't find it, right? It's just gone and God doesn't say, Micah doesn't say that he forgives our sins and covers them with the shallows. No, he covers them with the depths. You ever stood out on a boat in the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, can't see land anywhere? It's kind of horrifying, right? Like I've stood there on the ship on a cruise at night and looked out into the darkness and thought, dear God, don't let me fall off. Like, if you're lost out there, you just lost. Micah said, God so covered our sin that spiritually he's buried it in the depths of the sea. Now, think about that for a minute. The deepest part of the ocean that we know of is called the Mariana Trench. It's located just off the coast of the Japan. It's over 36,000 feet deep. To give you some magnitude for that, Mount uh, um, the, the, the highest peak in the world is Mount Everest, and it's just over 29,000 feet tall. The Mariana Trench is taller, deeper than Mount Everest is tall. But the Mariana Trench is five times wider than it is tall, which means it's 120 times the size of the Grand Canyon. And here's what God said. I've taken all your sin in Christ and I've buried it in the depths of the sea. God's forgiveness is available in Christ. God's forgiveness covers all of our sin and God's forgiveness is available to every 
human being. Did you hear it? Truly, amen. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. The children of man is a Greek phrase that referred to human beings in general. Every person on earth. It means nobody's outside of the amazing grace of God's forgiveness. You say, well, then how do I get in on it? Well, there's a one-word answer to that, and it's not a popular word. It's the word repentance. Ugh. Couldn't it have been like chocolate or <laughs> repentance? Jesus said, and he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Jesus said to his disciples, there's only one way to get in on the forgiveness of God and that is repentance. What is repentance? Well, here's what it is very simply. It's turning from my sin by faith to God embracing Jesus as the only hope of forgiveness. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, here's the invitation for you in just a few minutes. is to turn from your sin and trust Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. And when you, by faith, reach out and grab a hold of him, get this, all your sin is forgiven. But repentance is not a one-time act. For the child of God, it's a way of life because here's what happens. We pick the mantle back up and we start living in independence again on our own strength and we choose to sin against God. Doesn't change our relationship to God. Doesn't change the fact that we're already forgiven, but it breaks our fellowship with God. And you and I begin to live as if God's got something against us. Even though he's already forgiven us because we're holding on to our sin, we feel a separation. And for the Christian, there's a lifestyle, moment-by-moment moment repentance, where we turn from ourselves, yield control back to the Father, and in a fresh way embrace his forgiveness. God is a forgiving God. If you believe that, say amen. If you don't, Jesus will. He'll say amen. But here's the second truth, and I'm done with this one. And here's the serious warning. God's forgiveness can be Rejected. There's a lot of mystery surrounding verses 29 and 30 of this passage of Scripture. I'm going to read it again. After this profound statement on forgiveness, Jesus adds the word but. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Listen to that again. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, these next three words I believe are the saddest words in all the Bible. Never has forgiveness. There are people who will never experience the forgiveness of God. This word never in English, we translate it with one word. In the Greek language, it's literally four words. In the Greek language, it's uk ton iona. It literally means not in the forever. There's an eternal weight in that word never. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit Never, not now, not next month, not at death, not in eternity, never, no, not in forever. We'll experience the forgiveness of God, which raises a very big question. What does it mean by the phrase to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? Well, let me give you two defining statements about the Holy Spirit's role in forgiveness that will bring some clarity. Number one. Forgiveness can only be received in response to the Holy Spirit's work of convincing and convicting. Everything I've said to you today about forgiveness and God's forgiveness is 100% true and in line with Scripture, but here's the bottom line. You don't just wake up one day and go, you know what, I think I'm going to go get forgiven by God. No, it's in response 
to the convincing and convicting work of the Holy Spirit who makes the person of Jesus so real to you that you understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you and how awful your sin is in the sight of God. And it's under the convicting and convincing work of the Holy Spirit that we run to Jesus in salvation. That's why for me, I grew up in the church. I grew up a preacher's kid. I heard the gospel literally thousands of times. But one day when I was a freshman in college, I heard the gospel through the convincing and convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God. And something inside of me came alive and I ran to Jesus to be forgiven. You see, the forgiveness of God's salvation, the Holy Spirit is not a water faucet. You turn on and off when you're ready to deal with God. Which means today... If you are sensing the convicting and the convincing work of the Holy Spirit of God, you should run to Jesus. Second thing, you may reject the convincing and convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Hear me clearly God is sovereign. I was here last week and heard Pastor Scott preach that powerful sermon, and he talked about salvation being all of God, and it is. The grace, the faith, it's all of him. That's 100% true, but it's also true that God is so sovereign that within the scope of his sovereignty, he's allowed us as human beings the freedom to respond to his invitation of forgiveness, and you can reject that invitation. What is the sin that can never be forgiven? Here's what it is. I'm going to give it to you in a statement. To willfully and habitually reject the Holy Spirit's witness about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's what these people did in this text. They didn't just do it once. What, what they did wasn't an accident. They didn't slip up and say something accidentally. The Greek construction of this is that over and over and over and over with will and intention and volition over and over, they not only rejected the work of the Holy Spirit, they attributed the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan himself. One writer said it this way. It's not a single act, but a habitual action and attitude. The unforgivable sin is the stubborn refusal to acknowledge that God is working and has worked in the man Jesus. That's what these religious leaders did. They'd, met, they'd seen Jesus. They'd heard him preach. They'd seen his power. They'd witnessed his compassion and over and over and over again. They rejected and 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 they refused. And the scripture implies here that apparently these religious leaders had crossed the line and, the, and Jesus said about them, the Holy Spirit would never convince and never convict them again. You say, Pastor, does that happen today? Can you so reject the work of the Holy Spirit of God today that the Holy Spirit of God says, that's it, you've crossed the line. Here's, I'm, I'm going to be as honest as I can be. I don't know. As you read different writers about this passage of Scripture, you can't find two writers who really agree on what this really means. Some believe it was an event that could only happen while Jesus was physically on planet Earth and the Holy Spirit was working to introduce Jesus to the world. I don't know. But here's what I do know. If you die, having rejected the convincing and convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God, hear me very carefully. You will never have forgiveness. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, Pastor, I'm worried. Like, maybe I've already gone too far. Listen, no, no, no. If you're worried, you ain't gone too far yet. Because you know why you're worried? That's the convincing and convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God. today you need God's forgiveness and you are sensing the convicting and convincing work of the Holy Spirit here is the greatest thing I can say to you run 
to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Lay it at his feet. And embrace his gracious gift of forgiveness and salvation. Just a moment. Our team is going to lead us in a song after I pray. And there's really two responses I'm calling for today. You can obviously always come pray with a pastor about something going on in your heart, your life, your job, your family, but the two primary calls today, number one, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus and you feel the weight of your sin against God and the impact of your sin on your life, and you'd love to know that when you leave here today, it has all been buried in the depths of the sea of God's forgiveness and that there is nothing separating you from God. When we stand to sing in just a moment, there are going to be pastors all along the front. You come to one of these pastors and just say, I need Jesus. And just like I did as a freshman in college, back like in 1989, you can meet a God who is gracious and who longs to make you whole. Secondly, if you're here today and you're already a Christian and you know you've been forgiven, but You've been living in a pattern of sin. And you just need to embrace God's forgiveness in a fresh way. Maybe you want to come pray with a pastor. Or maybe you just want to come get in one of these altars. Maybe it's not anything big. Maybe it's just something small. Listen, it's the small little steps that lead to the big missteps. Maybe you just want to come make a fresh surrender. And just embrace God's forgiveness again. God, I know you've already forgiven me and I just receive it. Lord, forgive me for wallowing in the guilt and the shame of what you've already purchased and paid for. The altar is going to be open. The pastors are going to be here. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray you'd move as only you can. Lord, have your way today. Lord, I pray for those that don't know Jesus, that today, as soon as we stand to sing, they would come to one of these pastors and just say, I need Jesus, that they would repent. They would turn from their sin, turn from self to God by faith in Jesus. Lord, I pray for believers who started living again in an independent way, living in their own strength. God, that there would be a moment right now of running to Jesus and embracing again your forgiveness. God, have your way. Lord, move in power. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.